Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. This is your announcer, Jennifer Rouse. Brought to you by MarkRedfieldArt.com. And now, your host, Mark Redfield. I've known Marianne Perry for many, many years now. Um, I think we first met on a short film that was never completed, uh, unfortunately. And um, um, I have been pulling Marianne into projects. You hear her introduce our audio dramas. You hear her in our audio dramas. She is the narrator, Scheherazade, of Sinbad and the Pirate Princess, our first long-form audio novella, audio drama. And you're going to hear her in some wonderful upcoming things. Um, And I thought that of all of the great people that I'm working with now in these audio dramas that I wanted to introduce you to, I wanted to start by introducing you to Marianne Perry. Um, She has a wonderful voice, and um, I love working with her. And uh, so this is a little interview that we conducted so that you got to know her, her work, and the beginning of a series of introductions of some of the players that are going to be working with Redfield Arts Audio. I was just wondering, do you remember your first professional voiceover job? And what was it like? Was it nerve-wracking or a piece of cake? (laughs) Well, I do remember my first voiceover job. Um, It's kind of embarrassing. Um, Oh, gosh, I met this woman through an acquaintance, and she knew I was trying to break into radio, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, look, I have this car spot that I can't do, um, and I would like you to do it. And I guess I was maybe, maybe 25 So I went into the studio, and I don't remember the name of the studio, but it was in Timonium. It was not Studio 83, but um, the engineer was Chuck. I'm going to leave out his last name just in case he doesn't want me to say it. But, um, you know, I remember going into the booth, so there was the, the glass that separated me from the audio engineer, and I was given the script. And, you know, as much as people say that I'm quote unquote a natural, I was so nervous that I could I could not get through this 30 second spot without I was almost panicking like my voice was shaking and I thought I can't do this and um, I have no idea how they managed to cobble it all together but that was my first real commercial <laughs> voiceover um, and I think I kind of sucked but I do think they used it on the air, so I don't know. I should probably ask him. I still know him. I haven't talked to him for a while, but um, I'll have to ask him if he remembers that. So not a piece of cake. Where did you go to school to study theater? Uh, When did the theater bug bite you? Those are two different questions. Um, (laughs) uh, The theater bug bit me, I think, when I was four years old, and my brother... One of my brothers, um, who's 10 years older than I am, uh, was in Calvert Hall, and uh, he was in the band. And apparently, I somehow wandered up onto stage and took the microphone and started singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. (laughs) So (laughs) that's when it bit me. And um, my parents, you know, enrolled me in different theater camps and, um, you know, not the theater camps that are around today, but like things in like the basement of a church. Um, As a matter of fact, uh, one of my theater teachers when I was about nine or ten years old just saw me somewhere and recognized me and came up to me. I can't believe it. Chris Hill, love her to death. Um, And she was like, I taught you theater when you were nine or ten years old. And I completely remembered her. What a, I mean, that was crazy. Here it is. How many Years later, if I was nine years old, oh, maybe 20 years later. (laughs) Kidding you, I'm much older than 29. (laughs) Um, But, uh, yeah, so I did a few of those, like, theater things. And then I got into high school, and I couldn't sing. So I never had the lead in any play or musical in high school because I could not sing. So I was always, like, the nun in South Pacific. Did you even know there are nuns in South Pacific? (laughs) Or or I was like, I think I just snorted. Um, 
or I was like a tree in The King and I, um, things like that. Uh, and then I got into college and I went to Towson University, um, studied under Marvin Leschke. May she rest in peace, love her, and John Manlove and Dick Gillespie and, you know, everybody else who was around at that time. Uh, I loved it, but I didn't really put my heart and soul into it. Long story short, I thought, what am I going to do with a theater major? So I got into mass communication uh, with a public relations minor. From there, I did an internship with the Epilepsy Association. And um, I just so happened to be given the opportunity to go on People Are Talking. Remember where Oprah Winfrey started? People Are Talking. Well, she wasn't there. This was a few few years after that. And Richard Scher, um was the host. He used to co-host with Oprah, but now I think he was by himself. Anyway, after the show, uh, I got on to the set and did the PSA, the um, public service announcement. And I'll never forget the director. And I wish that I knew who this was because he really got me started in this career that has been so good to me over the past few decades. Um, he kind of peeked his head out from behind the camera and said, have you ever thought about broadcasting? Because you're a natural. So I went to my advisor um, at Towson, Les Bradley, love him. And I said, you know, here I am in my last year of school and I want to change my concentration from public relations to broadcasting. Do you think I can do it? And he said, well, you'll, have, you'll probably have to go like an extra semester. But yeah, you, yes, you can absolutely do that. So I did. And the rest is history. I've had a wonderful, wonderful career in radio and television and, and uh, the voiceover business. Um, it's been really wonderful. But getting back to theater, when I was about... I guess I was maybe 29 years old, um, and I was suffering from some panic attacks, and at that point I thought my broadcasting career was over, but um, I was trying to work through it, you know, uh, and I saw that there were auditions for a play at this theater called Axis Theater. Phenomenal, phenomenal theater. Um, and the, the play was called Eye of God. And I had not done any acting at all. I mean, I, since I was in, in college. So I, I went to the theater to audition for it in an effort to kind of overcome this whole panic disorder thing that I was going through. Plus, I really wanted to do theater. And I auditioned, and I got the lead in the play, which, oh my gosh. I mean, that was probably one of the happiest moments of my life. Um, I mean, well, of course... The birth of my son was the happiest moment of my life, but getting the lead in that play, Brian Klaus was the director. Um, he and John Lippitz owned Axis Theater. And uh, anyway, over the next two years, I was in eight plays, like back to back to back to back. And it was probably, again, besides my child, they were probably the best or two of the best years of my life. Did you ever think that your theater training at Towson would lead to a career as a voice actor? No, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a voice over actor or a voice actor or a voiceover artist <laughs> when I was at Towson. I had no idea. Um, I know that people had said that they liked my voice, which by the way, I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a, um, a cold, so I'm a little bit hoarse, but um, you know, I, I had had people up to that point say that they liked the way I sound, but I didn't even know there was such a thing as a VO artist. I just didn't. Tell me about how your voice work has branched out into other areas, like you doing the morning news. Well, honestly, my voiceover work is a result of me doing other stuff. So I started out as a news person. When I got out of college, my first job was being a news director on the Eastern Shore. I left Baltimore for two years, and I worked first at WCEM as the morning and afternoon news person and the news director. And then I went to WQHQ in Salisbury, and then I came back to Baltimore and was the um, morning news person as part of the morning zoo. Remember when they used to have morning zoos <laughs> in radio? This was back in the, gosh... I guess the early 90s, um, yeah. So I was part of the morning zoo at WGRX 
uh, for a couple of years. Then I went to Metro Traffic Control, and from there I was hired to be the midday announcer at WLIF. Um, that came out of the blue. I mean, it was amazing. I got a call from the program director of WLIF when I was doing their um, traffic, and um, essentially the job was half the hours of <laughs> my traffic job, Metro Traffic Control, and double the money. So it was a no-brainer. Anyway, I stayed there for years and years and years. And from there, I decided, or I figured out, that my favorite part of the job was doing the production or doing the commercials that had to air. I just loved it. And I finally took a big leap when my son was three years old. I wanted to be, a, at that point, I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, and I was working very long days because I was doing um, my radio show and then doing all my freelance work after that. And my dear friend Ron Leverton from Studio 83 said to me, he said, trust me, if you leave radio, you're going to double your income in the first year. And that's what happened. <laughs> I feel very blessed. Um, you know, I've had my ups and downs, but so it's not that my voiceover work led me to other work. My other work led me to my voiceover career. And yes, I do do the morning news now for the Maryland News Network, kind of going back to my roots. I've been the morning anchor for, gosh, it's almost three years now. And I love it. I get to work from home. You know, it's the best of both worlds. So I, you know, I do my morning news and then I take a little nap and then I do my voiceover work in the afternoon. I either go to local studios or I work here from home. We'll be right back with our interview with Marianne Perry, but first, a word from our sponsor. MarkRedfieldArt.com Here's what just a few of today's art lovers are saying. You're so ugly you could be a modern art masterpiece. Clap, clap, clap. Ah. Now that's good. Bodies, you give it all such a glow. I don't know if it's art, but I like it. He could there was a painter. He could paint an entire apartment in one afternoon, two coats. So don't forget, markredfieldart.com. Cartoons for people. What's the hardest thing about doing morning news? My sleep schedule. Honestly, I'm a night person, um, and anyone who knows me knows that. So um, uh, my sleep schedule is pretty messed up. I, I sleep only about three hours at a time. So I usually go to bed around 11 or 12, get up at 3 or 4, do my news duties, which I love, by the way. I really love to write and deliver the news. I've never been a reporter. I hated that part of the job. Like, I didn't like interviewing people that much. Um, but I do love writing and anchoring the morning news. So anyway, I generally will take a nap at some point during the day. I have to, because I've only slept three to four hours. Um, and then I do my voiceover work, whether it's going to local studios or working here from home. Tell me about the strangest voiceover you've ever been asked to do. Okay. Honestly, I had to be the voice of a sock puppet called Lammy. <laughs> And I hated it for some reason. And I used to wish that I was, like, behind a curtain when I had to perform this. Um, but it was for a furniture company. <laughs> and my dear friend Johnny Panzarella played the bull. And he was so good. He, like, had this New York accent. And I had to be Lammy. I don't know if I could even recreate it. Let me see. <clears throat> Hi, this is Lammy. I hated it. We didn't go to Towson together at exactly the same time. Do you remember how we met, and what are your memories of that project? <laughs> uh, I do remember knowing you at Towson somehow. I guess you graduated before you were there before I was, because we, we weren't, yeah, you're right, we weren't there together. Um, <laughs> but the first major project that we worked on together was that film, with Vince Lancheesy, Lan, can't remember his last name. Um, so the film with Larry Malkus 
and you, and um, it was just a, it was a trailer. Um, and um, yeah, well, and you know this, but I had like a major crush on you, <laughs> and I got to kiss you in that trailer, which was pretty cool. Like I, I, I some there was like a gun involved, and I had to answer the front door and you came in and we had a passionate kiss and then I had to do this scene where like the gun was shaking in my hand and whatever became of that project but anyway <laughs> that's a pretty funny memory <laughs> yeah I was wondering if I imagined that but uh, I, I know I've seen the film and I know that you and I talked about it and no I don't have no idea what happened to that film um, he spent a lot of time and a lot of money on it and I thought it was a short a complete short and um, not just a trailer I'm so happy that you're part of the repertory company, Redfield Arts Audio, and that you're the voice of our podcasts. You were wonderful, uh, Scheherazade and Sinbad and the Pirate Princess. I hope you're looking forward to working on the future projects with me as much as I am. Of course. I always love working with you. Um, and thank you very much for the compliments. That's very nice. Yes, absolutely. I want to keep working with you. I mean, I love voiceover work, I love acting, and um, this lets me do both. In the past, I've pulled you into various projects, I've pulled you into live readers' theater events, and into a reading of my new play that I'm developing, Rabid Dreams of the Master Race. Do you miss doing live theater like I do? I miss being on stage so much you have no idea. The sense of community is amazing. Um, being on stage is second to none. Um, I miss it. And I miss, um, the thing about theater is if you're doing a play that you love, you get to relive it every single night and every single rehearsal. The thing about me is I love the audition process, I love the rehearsal process, and I love the performance. Um, and I haven't done theater in so very long. And I miss it. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll get back into it one day. You never know. You've started teaching voice acting. Tell us about that. Is it exciting? Are you learning and relearning things? Tell us about your voice teaching experience. I was so nervous when I was first offered this job of teaching at Stevenson University because I had to come up with my own curriculum. So I had a three-hour class once a week for 15 weeks. And I thought, how in the world am I going to come up with 15 weeks worth of curriculum for three-hour classes every week. Um, I'm happy to say that by the end of it, I felt like I needed more time with the students. I had a really great class. Nine really eager, wonderful kids. I say kids. I mean, you know, students. They were all juniors and seniors. Um, so eager to learn, very receptive, and uh, I loved it. it you know, and I I found out some stuff about the history of the voiceover industry that I had never really bothered to learn, and now I'm glad that I know. Uh, and and coaching other people kind of makes me, you know, examine my own performance as well. You know, am I enjoying it? You know, that's one of the things that I tell my students or anyone that I coach. Make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. And don't read the spot. Don't read the commercial. Perform it. Or, you know, um, you know, act like you're talking to your best friend. I just absolutely love teaching, and I hope to continue to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for taking a few minutes and answering some silly questions. I just wanted um, our listeners to get to know you. And... Uh, I can't wait to work with you again soon. I'll be emailing you a script in the morning. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. Please come back again for our next show. The Redfield Arts Review and the original content of this program is copyright the Mark Redfield Company. Shopping for explosives by Coconut Monkey Rocket. Licensed under Attribution Non-Commercial International License. All other content used by permission of the respective rights holders or used for educational and informational purposes. Original music, sound design, and engineering is by Jennifer Rouse. This is your announcer, Marianne Perry.
Redfield Arts Audio. Songs of Giants, the Poetry of Pulp. Poetry by H.P. Lovecraft, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Robert E. Howard. Music by Jennifer Rouse. Readings by Mark Redfield. The steeples are white in the wild moonlight, and the trees have a silver glare. Past the chimneys high, see the vampires fly, and the harpies of upper air that flutter and laugh and stare. I carved a woman out of marble when the walls of Athens echoed to my fame, and in the myrtle crown were shrines. I stood at the bar, at the Spread Eagle Bar, a drink in a drink whilst I smoked a cigar. When in walks a gent that I ain't never see, and he lets out a bell. The dawns at bay. The dead lay littered on our decks. Our masts were shot away. We beat them back with broken blades till crimson ran the tide. Death thundered in the cannon smoke when Richard Grenville died. We should have blown her hull apart and sunk beneath the main. The people saw upon his wrist the scars of her head instead of toes, and a beard adorned its throat. On a set of rustic reeds sweetly played this hybrid man. Not cared I for earthly needs, for I knew this was Pan. For more great audio, visit redfieldartsaudio.com.